My experience has been uh, with family physicians. Uh, there is a re reluctance to talk about mental illness. And um, I'm thinking about two or three, you know, uh, who uh, hesitated in taking over my son's care. Um, so how do you kind of break down this kind of attitudinal um, barrier um, to that? How do we get, because this is so interesting and so exciting, so how do we get, how do we get going? So obviously when you can't get care for your family members, it's distressing. It's actually something actually we know isn't achieving the right outcomes when we can't get the care we need. Um, and I think what you were saying there actually is something that resonates a lot when we're looking at helping people in general. Um, so you notice that there weren't people willing to take on the kind of care or intensity of care you're looking for for your son. Um, attitudes could be part of it. We noticed three people, for example, said no um, in this case. But it's recognizing it isn't just a problem for you. It isn't just a problem for those three doctors. It's actually something systemic. We see it everywhere. We see it in every city. We see it in every province. We see it across Canada. Um, and that makes us realize what's actually making it happen that way is actually bigger than the one person. It's bigger than just attitude. We know attitude is an issue uh, because stigma by mental health doesn't just exist in the general population. It exists entrenched in the health system. It's part of the training that people are given in every part of the health system. It actually doesn't have enough integration, enough focus on mental health, or knowing even how to connect mental health to other physical health conditions. So we're taught the system design. That's why we have psychiatrists and we have internal medicine. We're siloing how health is delivered and understood. Um, the only medical side, I'm talking about now physician side, where actually the pieces are connected has traditionally been in primary care in, in family doctor's practice. The challenge was most of them were trained where very little time was actually spent on mental health care. And when it was, it was actually very separate and distinct. So they had one rotation, for example, in psychiatry, but they had rotations for the rest of the four years in every other physical health condition. So the amount of experience they have on mental health care is significantly limited compared to their experience in physical health. It's also much easier for them to learn to manage adding a new drug to replace the old drug they used for a physical health condition than it is, for example, to know how to manage complex counseling, other issues that are involved in mental health care. So we know there's a capacity issue, and that's what was highlighted there. So their ability to know how to do it is a big issue. In teams where you have family health teams, for example, where you have access to counselors and other people to work and augment the care, then there's the ability to say, I may not know how to do it, but somebody else on my team may be able to help me do it better. And so if I have the ability, then I may take on more complex patients because I can actually do the right care for them, even if I don't have the personal capacity. Unfortunately, as we know, the way that the primary care setup is, is in Ontario right now, and especially we're talking about regions like this, so um, family health teams are very common outside of, of Toronto, um, in rural areas, that's where they're mostly concentrated. There's a big disparity in how this works. If you look, for example, in Central Lynn, which is where this is, or Toronto Central Lynn, which is downtown, um, only 25% of family practice is actually with a team. Actually, with a family health organization, only 12.5% is actually with a team. So the vast majority are just family doctors on their own, maybe in a group practice, but literally nobody else helping them aside who they hire themselves. And so the capacity is very low. And we're very worried about, for example, Southeast Toronto, where the average age of the family doctors there is 75, right? So they have them, in fact, they have some of the most complex patients medically in the city, and they're on their own, literally maybe a secretary, maybe not, and that's about it. So the worry we have right now is they, they're worried about doing the right care and not failing somebody and taking them on and knowing how to do it. I think attitude is a big part of it. It's worth addressing for sure. Um, but also recognizing what's stopping it from happening. So the same way to approach any patient saying, why are people behaving the way they do in general in life? Why, did, why people make their decisions? Is the same way you look at health, the health system and providers and why do they behave the way that they do? Because it's a system making it happen. There's a history making it happen. There are, in their mind, there's a logic to it. Um, so how we go out solving it is having those conversations. What's challenging to you? How can I actually help make this something you can do? Um, and approaching it from a support frame, but seeing are there ways of stitching together the system to make it help. They don't know what to, the community services there are any more than you do. There's no great blue book since the 1980s that tells me what, what community services they are. We don't have, for example, the social worker to access easily to know um, what actually is available to support our patients. So it's left like everything on one person's head and they get overwhelmed and they'll say, I can't do this in five minutes or 20 minutes, whatever time they're allocated to do that complex care. So it's a big challenge, but something we actually could work on better together, I think.
medical school and, and everybody who's in academia will tell you it is the most fought after per minute time for every strain. So everybody in the sun is actually fighting for every minute with the medical student to train them on something new. Um, so there is more mental health now than there used to be for sure. And we're looking at more integration. So the one thing that's happened, for example, in family medicine, so we'll talk about that environment in particular because all residencies are different. Um, so there is a bigger focus on integration happening in, in, in family medicine. We have more care. There's actually UFT, for example, more patient-centered co-design workshops even. So not knowing, it's not necessarily just teaching you all the content, but seeing how do you actually learn how to work together um, with patients. So more patient uh, teachers involved in co-design workshops for medical students. Um, so that's, that's beginning to change the system a bit from there. But we're very cognizant that we can't rely on actually teaching all the medical students great stuff because they won't graduate for what, seven, 10 years, um, and when they come out in the environment, if the environment's still the same, we know, and this, there's evidence to show this, within one or two years, any new skills learned are lost if they're not implemented. If the environment doesn't allow them to implement it, you'll get the same old. So there's a normalizing effect for everybody. Like monkey see, monkey do, you train the new monkey to do the new thing. Because that's what you survive in the new wildlife with, right? So I think the bigger focus that we're talking about through things like collaborative care is how do we change the environment for the people who are practicing right now because that's actually gonna change whoever comes into it to practice because they're able to do that. So looking at it from the perspective, what's actually enabling the right behaviors and enabling the wrong behaviors and decisions that we're making currently. And there's a lot of work that we can do together with patients and families and with policy workers. You had the announcement yesterday from the, um, the ministry looking at actually mental health funding and it's a small amount hopefully in how they implement it will be more integrated framework because when actually they do siloed care, we're just creating more fragments, we're all being stretched apart even more. It's not actually helping people navigate the system any better. Looking at it, it sounds like the, there might be somebody who actually is skilled enough to understand the significance of that test. And that part depends on the evidence from the test. Well, we don't yet have a lot of for genetic testing. It depends on what you're looking at. So I know there's a study that Kemich was the, U, the partner in Canada for a US study looking at um, doing um, the uh, um, testing for many genetic swabs. Like they did a swab looking at how you metabolize various medications. Um, and that study is now over. It, and so the um, significance of it is still being evaluated through the process. Um, so we know people may metabolize drugs faster or slower, and that's something that what that study looked at. It didn't necessarily tell you the outcomes, though. It just told you the metabolism rate of a drug was different, and you may choose something other than something else based on metabolism alone. Um, so the test that your daughter may have done, um, I'm not sure exactly what it is. So if there is true knowledge out there of the significance of the test, um, because as many companies produce tests, because that's how they sell products, um, but this medical significance is not always clear just because the test is available. That's based on the evidence out there. Um, so knowing how you implement that, that piece of information from a lab test to a person is a really hard gap oftentimes. It may not exist the information in, in the medical literature yet. Um, so it may not be simply that somebody doesn't know what the test answer is. What does it mean for your care can be an open question still. There's a lot of unknowns in medicine still. Um, so that's separate, for example, from saying if there's a psychiatrist who could um, understand the significance and implement it, that's a separate process. And then your goal would be how do I get access to the psychiatrist for that review? Um, and so there's some specialties. So the, um, there's these uh, e-referral programs that are started for some specialties. And this is a pilot the ministry is undertaking right now where it's almost like a, a minimal intervention. We send information, we get a quick answer back, but it's not a true referral for the patient there to be seen. It's like allowing some connections between primary care and certain specialties right now. So we're looking how can you create point in time. So in, in a model like collaborative care, you would have a psychiatrist there. That model won't go everywhere in the country right away because it's actually resource intensive. But are there ways to begin to use that when you need to use it more carefully? Maybe I'll add a little bit to the genetic testing. Uh, the study was for GeneSept, that was for uh, the CAMH study. Um, so I've had quite a few patients come in with GeneSept results. It doesn't usually change my clinical decision making. Um, the reason being GeneSept is really around metabolism of drugs, as a, but clinical effectiveness of the drug, uh, there, we just don't know. Um, so in the massive studies, and these are the American studies um, where they spent, I think, the, one of the biggest studies uh, ever, um, uh, was the uh, uh, Katie study. Um, it, they, they did a treatment algorithm 
and it was fairly similar whichever medication you started with. Um, and so the reality is that uh, if we talk about depression, uh, two-thirds of patients will respond with a first-line drug, irrespective of whatever drug you choose. Um, they haven't updated that study, that was a number of years ago, they haven't really looked at the GeneSept. Um, the reason we had it done here for a long time was because the drug company or, or the company that was doing the, the, the genetic testing was just picking up the cost of it. Um, I actually saw a patient today who was wondering about the effectiveness of it. I said, look, you, you might spend $1,500, and most of my patients don't have $1,500, um, but is it really going to change what we do in the here and now, and it usually doesn't? Maybe once or twice someone has been ultra slow metabolizer of a medication and has had side effects, and I said, okay, maybe this is why, because you're, you're metabolizing the drug really slowly, but it doesn't change on clinical effectiveness. There is no genetic test that I'm familiar with at this point in time uh, that can uh, sort of bring it down to SSRI versus SNRI. Um, the reason being that the test is showing metabolism of the drug. Um, as far as I know, there's, there's nothing that I've seen that shows clinical effectiveness of a drug. So just because your body metabolizes the drug more slowly or more quickly doesn't mean it will work better or worse for you. I, I'm not sure if that makes sense. So I think this is where people get tripped up. They see this. It's a really nice sheet. It has the red, yellow, green. Is that the... Yeah, has red, yellow, green, it tells you, okay, if it's red, maybe your body metabolizes that really slowly, try not to use that drug, but it doesn't tell you which one's going to be effective. And, and just to add to that, I've had great success with some medications, but I've just had to stop because they had side effects. And so there may be other limiting factors as well. So um, again, I, I could be really hopeful about something and it looks really good on paper and it looks really good to start with. As we go up on the dose, we get side effects and, and, and we have to stop and try something else anyway. At this point, uh, probably about 70% of the family physicians are in the family health team. Um, the one challenge we've had is actually finding enough psychiatrists to provide that service. So not all of the 170 family physicians have a psychiatrist physically in their office. It's the ideal. It's what we're working towards. But in <coughs> we've also developed a model where there are hubs. So one hub would serve 15, 20 family physicians in that area who don't have access to a psychiatrist in their office. We started um, many years ago. Um, I was working in a community mental health clinic, and I think there were a couple of things that had influenced it. Partly I'd worked in England where you know, the, the concept of home visiting and closer connections between psychiatry and, and uh, general practice, as it was, I think was more an integral part of practice. I also spent some time in northern Ontario during my residency where my supervisor, who was Dave Dawson, who Marvin <laughs> referred to in the introductory remarks, was in Hamilton. I was in Fort Francis. And all of the mental health care was delivered by family physicians or a mental health team without the family. So I think there were lessons from there that we sort of applied in Hamilton initially to our work in an outpatient, well, in a community mental health clinic. And then we got involved with the forerunner of the family health team, which was the HSO mental health, the HSO program. So we started as the HSO mental health program health service organization. It was similar to the family health teams in that it was an alternate funding model, um, so a capitation model. And I think we were just lucky to be in the right place at the right time. And that model then sort of become the, became the prototype for what evolved into the FIT model. And yeah, we, we have worked with a number of places over the years who have come to see us. And we've also had the opportunity to go to many different places to uh, you know, see how they work. There are lots of different models of primary care, which uh, I think David can talk about more in a more informed way than I can. But um, certainly, um, you know, fa uh, um, family health teams are one, the capitation models, they're community health centers. There are other models for 
um, specific kinds of group practice in other parts of the province as well as fee-for-service. And I think there is more and more a recognition not only that mental health is an integral part of primary care, but that um, wherever we are, you know, and wherever we're looking at the situation, we need to find new ways of working together. I think, so although there are lots of different places in Ontario that have family health teams, I think the other thing for me that is critical is that all mental health services follow the same kind of principles for working closer with family physicians and person and family centered care because there aren't the resources at this point and you know this it's one of the criticisms of family health teams is have they developed a two tier service um, you know that you get if your family physician is in a family health team then do you get more rapid access to services that if your family physician is you know, a solo physician, downtown Toronto, fee-for-service, you may not get. Um, so, uh, uh, but, but I, I think where we really need to be looking at is how any mental health service can work better with family physicians to improve transitions, reduce fragmentation, improve communication, because in, in terms of the number of people who are going to get care, I think that's where, you know, uh, the best return on investment may be. I don't want necessarily to comment on a specific individual case. I mean, to me, that strikes me again as we can't do that, meaning we don't do that or we won't do that, because I think we do need to be flexible. I think there are reasons why we want to make sure that wherever possible an individual is seeking care for themselves, to make sure they do want care, to make sure they know the the kinds of things that, that may be offered. Um, but I think there also has to be a place where if the individual, for whatever reasons, isn't able to, and a family member contact, contacts us, we explore it and, and see what we can do. You know, there, there are complexities because sometimes if, you know, I call someone and say, you know, your mum, um, suggested we give you a call it may not be the way to engage them so I think we have to be thinking about all those things as well but I think we have to be able to look at all of the different and creative ways that we can engage someone in care rather than just this single pathway and if you don't fit it or you fall off it then it's too bad but it's your problem it's not your problem it's our problem because we've designed a system that isn't working I, I mean, it is the whole issue about um, you know, the balance between protecting someone's rights and not just their rights, but their autonomy and their ability and, and supporting their ability to make decisions for themselves. But at the same time, looking at their overall welfare in the broader context that you're describing and their really difficult decisions and even with the best intentions we sometimes get it wrong but I think the the key is not to have hard and fast rules you know we don't do this or we only do this or the and and to be able to uh, again um, you know meet someone on their terms rather than our terms so our terms is we have an intake process and you have to come to this building and you have and that may not be the way to do it and you know we may need to meet them at Tim Hortons for the first appointment before we even know where we're going. So I find, as a family caregiver, um, our experience is not, um, the system doesn't see it. We're invisible. We're invisible until something horrible happens, and then we're in the headlines. So um, it would be my wish that we could spend more time in looking at innovative ways to engage people and their families. Um, and I know that's a very difficult uh, uh, thing to ask, but we need to do it because the outcomes are so negative. Um, just my little thing there. <laughs> and I, I would say that the answer to your question is in this room, because I think the people who know best are the people who've been through that experience. I mean, I have some ideas, but most of them are based upon things that I've tried or been involved with at work or don't. But I mean, collectively, you know, you have, I would guess, tons of different ideas about how these different solutions could be uh, uh, you know, uh, 
um, approach. Mm -hmm. And I think our challenge is how we can tap into that knowledge, which again was you know the slide about you know not using the resources in the healthcare system that that could make it work. What happens to any member of a family system affects everybody else. And that, that works both ways. So if parents are experiencing stress or can't you know, get together to make a, a, a shared decision, it's going to affect what happens with their children or parents or other relatives. And same the, the other way around, that, that when someone is, you know, when you go to bed not knowing if your child is safe or you know you it i mean it's and you're doing that every single day it's going to take a toll and when you worry about that because you have good reason to worry about that because something has already happened i mean i think that's where your kind of post traumatic thoughts come in and, and I, I would never use the phrase post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I tend to think of it as post, the way the military do. It's post-traumatic stress injury because it's not a disorder, and particularly at the level that we're talking about it. But it's something that you know has left a scar. I, I think that's a really great point because, in a way, it's like a, a game. You know, I can't talk to you without permission, but I can listen to you, and you can't ask, but you can tell. But I, I think that is a very effective way, and I think that should be kind of a never event, that we should never not take a call from a relative just because we can't speak to them. I would hope that if someone is seeing a psychiatrist or a mental health clinician for an hour, they'd be able to probe a little bit to get some idea. You know, if, if someone was, uh, and, and not necessarily extremely unwell, but if there were some psychotic symptoms and they were then able to hold it together, I would hope that they'd be able to come out with some idea that maybe there was a little bit more to the presentation than there is. But again, it's not always easy, and, and some people are very good at being able to hold it together in, in, uh, in selective ways. The other thing I'd say about your, your second point is, and, and we don't think of this enough, but the, the importance of an enduring relationship with one person, um, that you're building a sense of trust, you're building a sense of continuity, but you're also planning for future eventualities. So after this admission, um, the conversation is, what should I do if you can see that you're starting to get sick again? How can we do things differently? Because I know you don't want to end up back in the hospital. So it's not everything, you know, just in one shot, you have to do everything. I think sometimes, even though it's, really sad that you can't do everything this time you're also thinking about the next and the next and it's not eight admissions it's three admissions and then you're into a different treatment plan or a different approach so i think we have to think longitudinally as well as in the moment so underlining the the point about the advanced planning i think that's a core factor almost like the ulysses idea when you know you're not going to be in control of your faculties, what can you do? And there's a lot of cues. And I know there's also for general things like schizophrenia, there's advanced, there's the cognitive planning and, the, and cognitive uh, behavioral therapy for uh, patients with schizophrenia that can help in it planning ahead for things like this as well. Um, there was one point I think that these questions about how do you reconcile when family members are giving different information um, with uh, than, than the patient themselves. Um, so we're all bound by the Mental Health Act. You're going to have a physician coming in to talk to you about that in particular, how we reconcile that, because in the end, all healthcare providers are bound by that legislation. We have, the, we can't take away somebody's rights until these really strict criteria are first met. Um, and so 
how do you work around that and have advanced care planning directives that say when does it come to effect? If they're actually in control of their faculties as far as assessments go, then, then the, the substitute decision making act may not be valid until that actually is considered um, activated. So I think planning ahead together and having um, written agreements with family members in advance or queues are probably the only way to do it because until the law changes, um, all the system is bound to have to follow that legislation no matter what. Um, taking information is always something we can do, but often we'll disclose it and share it with, with the patient themselves, saying, hey, this was brought to my attention, how do we address it, how do you address, answer what, what has been said, and working together. I just want to say, because I think we've had this conversation before, a long time ago, and you talked about rights, and I said, well, you, you know, what about my rights? You know, so I think that that's what families are, are, you know, a little bit concerned about. It's a legal discussion, which means you're talking to the lawmakers, which is the MPPs. Um, and, so, and actually, for something like this, it actually is MPs as well, because there's federal statutes for it as well. Um, so it's a difficult challenge, but until it's understood a certain way, it, so case law is how it's also understood, because there's challenges. There's already in, as you'll learn when you have the next uh, talk you have here, is what is the process when, say, somebody who actually has been formed uh, wants to challenge it, the conditions of how they challenge it, and what has to be proven to, to allow the physician's um, decision to actually stand even, because it can be challenged in a certain time frame as well. So these are the, we're all in the same, but we actually want the best outcomes, and we're all looking for that wiggle room within the law to allow us to do the best thing for that person in the environment, taking in all the information, including what's given by family members. So there's a way that we can get on the same page, because that's actually the goal we all have. Nobody actually wants to leave somebody hanging, because I can tell you, every physician who actually doesn't respond to a, a, a worry raised by a family member worries just as much as you do that a bad thing could happen, and they actually weren't able to act on it because they didn't have the criteria that they had to meet before they could actually act on it. It's one of the most stupid paradoxes in a way when we have to say to someone or a family, sorry, they have to get worse before they can get better. But, you know, as Javid was saying, our hands are, are tied. I do a lot of consenting passing board hearings. Um, I do a lot of the legal hearings, um, superior court and uh, at the CCB level. Um, the law of the land is the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, and there was a very famous example, the Starson. Uh, he was a professor and uh, the same law firm that managed to get that to the Supreme Court is involved in our communities and they do come to the consent and capacity board hearings um, and uh, they, they challenge us on everything. Um, so I've had uh, hearings that have gone on more than six hours uh, because everything has been challenged. We can't always have lawyers at our hearings um, and essentially we don't usually have lawyers at our hearings. Very rarely do I have a lawyer. Uh, so we've had to become experts on the Mental Health Act and then the Health Care Consent Act. Um, so the, some of the laws are federal, but some are provincial. For example, British Columbia, I believe, I, I've never worked there, but uh, they have to notify the family when a patient is discharged from hospital. Uh, whereas in Ontario, that doesn't exist. So things may happen differently in different provinces. Um, I, I'm here with you um, in terms of families needing to know what's going on. Um, from my perspective, I'm a psychiatrist. I, you know, Maybe I punch out at the end of the day, but families are always living with their family members who are going through mental health challenges, um, and they bear the burden of all of it. Um, the, the police were very frustrated as well with all of this because they couldn't even apprehend patients under the Mental Health Act uh, until the law changed in about 2001. Um, I think it was called Brian's Law. Uh, there was a case where uh, uh, a sports, uh, I think it was a, a sports commentator, was, was, was killed by a patient who had been coming in and out of the hospital a number of times. Uh, so the law changed to allow for community treatment orders. It allowed for the police to apprehend individuals, not just on their direct uh, observation of things, but also what people around them were telling them. I guess uh, what I'm trying to say, um, a lot of family members that come from other countries uh, are, are, are shocked at how we have to deal with the, uh, uh, with, with the legal aspect of things. Uh, so things that would be absolutely nothing in another country. What do you mean you can't just inject them? <laughs> just, you know, just put them in a chair and just inject them. That's what we do back home. Um, but I think, uh, you know, in, in our society, autonomy is very much uh, respected. Um, and really, if anyone is interested in learning more about it, if you read the Starson case, it's all online. It's, it's, it's all accessible. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the doctors had the best of intentions. The review board had 
again, they, they, they got in trouble for having the best of intentions, and then the appeal courts and the Supreme Court struck down the finding of incapacity that was made uh, by the doctor that was upheld by the review board. So the review boards have become much more attuned to this. Um, we've had, my experience has been that uh, individuals have uh, much been much more willing to exercise their rights uh, in terms of uh, filing for uh, review boards and then even filing from the review boards for the superior courts. Um, the best thing I think families can do is go to appointments. Um, so if your family member says, uh, you know, I don't want you there, just go to the appointment. Uh, you know, there's always going to be a family dynamic. It's always going to affect how you interact with the individual. But if you're not there, your voice is not heard. Um, uh, something that I find helpful, I mean, I, I work mostly in patients, if family members can prepare a timeline of events um, and they can sort of document what's been going on, what they've been observing, uh, what they're seeing, and, uh, you know, having a timeline, maybe that's the way I think, but I think chronologically, so having a timeline for me is very helpful. Uh, so first family meetings I might have with individuals on inpatient units, I ask the family to br bring me a timeline so if it ever does come to a board hearing, we can present that as evidence. Um, at board hearings, uh, families can testify. Um, so often I will ask families to testify. Um, it does create some issue at times in terms of relationships with family members. Sometimes they get very upset when they hear what's going on. But oftentimes uh, individuals who do the hearings, they're very happy that they were heard because uh, they feel that they're not heard. So if you sit down in a room with, for three hours or so and, and you feel heard. So I think that this, it's, it's a very delicate balance uh, between uh, the rights that individuals have uh, to autonomy and, 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 and other rights uh, of what goes in their body and, and whatnot, uh, to the rights for their health information um, and uh, for safety for the community at large. Um, I don't think there's a perfect answer anywhere. Uh, a lot of it is driven by our own values as a society. Uh, so what does a society value? Um, and then that gets translated into laws. But having said that, on top of that, there is the case law, so things that have been decided um, that also dictates um, some of what's going on as well. So it's fairly complicated. There's a lot going on. Uh, we are here with you. We do understand the frustration that families go through. Sometimes our hands are tied. Uh, but one way I try and get around it is, is really having just families show up to appointments. Uh, there can be nothing better than that. Uh, lend your voice. And then other times I will just, just do family meetings. Uh, so the more family meetings I do, the more I can hear what's going on. And then I, I often think of the families as the weather vane. Um, so they kind of tell me what, what direction we're going in and, and what's going on. Um, so, if, I, I mean, on, no one can take away your role as a family member. No one can usurp that role. And even if people are upset with you, you're always going to have that role in, in, in that person's life. Um, and so if, if people are challenging you, you say, wait, like, maybe I'm not the professional here, but I'm mom, I'm sister, I'm brother, I'm whatnot, and these are my concerns. Um, so I think it, if we do that collaboratively, I think it works. And um, we may not always get the outcomes we want, but at least if we're heard, maybe that might be a step moving forward. So I don't know. I don't have a great answer. Uh, it's very complex. Um, but uh, uh, in our society, autonomy is valued very, very highly. And I think that's the struggle that uh, a lot of family members have. I feel like I talked a lot. Uh, and I wanted to clarify the, the last, uh, it, it wasn't the KD. The KD was the antipsychotic study, the, the study I mentioned. It was a STAR-D study. Um, yeah, so sorry. It's so nice to have Mackenzie Health here. Um, I'm wondering um, if we could just have Ryan uh, explain your role at the hospital. So this is actually just my second week um, joining with Mackenzie Health. Um, my previous background before that was working um, on an ACT team. I'm not sure if a lot of uh, you are familiar with that team. Um, but one thing I can say from my experience there, um, I'm guessing there's a lot of family members here today. Um, clients who have family members actively involved in their care, it makes an enormous difference. And I can see that um, with the outcomes of our patients, the ones that have family members come with them to appointments who are advocates, it does make a huge difference. Um, so I just, just wanted to put that out there for those of you that I see that are very frustrated right now. Um, I think you guys really are making a big difference in their lives. Ryan's actually in a new role. We haven't had a patient care coordinator for outpatients. Uh, patient care coordinator is sort of at the manager level um, and, is, uh, and, and Ryan's sort of got to define his job as he goes a little bit as well. 
Um, so we're hoping to um, look a little bit at our outpatient roles and, uh, and see how we can streamline things. Um, in the background, we have been doing some work trying to figure out how um, we can shorten wait times here, there, and, and how we can serve families. Um, one issue we do have that really comes up is, is if we start seeing a family and we want to develop the longitudinal relationships, um, that does mean that somewhere else that time is taken. We do have some therapy, um, and so a lot of our patients who don't have um, access to other resources, uh, we do have some individual appointments. We do have an urgent clinic, um, so an urgent psychi psych psychiatric clinic. Uh, so we do see patients there within a week or two, depending on the urgency. And even if someone is a family doctor sending in a referral or whatnot, we are sort of triaging it on our end as well, and we're trying to see if there's any red flags. So even if a family doctor hasn't identified as urgent, we might identify it as urgent and, and move it along that uh, way. So uh, Ryan's, uh, I think, got 30 or 40 staff now that uh, he's probably got to take a look at and figure out what their roles are and, and how he can integrate things. Uh, we're very happy he's here because he's, uh, he's worked with the ACT team. He's done some quality improvement work uh, with the ACT team, the stuff he's taken on on his own accord and tried to figure out how to make things better. So. So it might actually come as a shock to many people in the room that often we will ask to speak to families and we will get nothing. They will not call us back, they will not talk to us. Uh, I had a patient in the eMERGE for, I think for three days, I couldn't make a decision because the, the mother wouldn't talk to me. Uh, so <laughs> that might be kind of shocking, but uh, that happens as well. Uh, this is a self-selected group, um, so for that other one it would be an empty, empty room if we tried to have a meeting. Um, so I think, <sighs> So there's a, there's a couple loopholes in the uh, Personal Health Information Protection Act. One is if a patient is admitted to a mental health facility, um, we, uh, we don't actually need their consent to get information from other healthcare facilities, which is very interesting. Uh, so that's section 35.2 um, of the uh, Personal Health Information Protection Act. Um, the reason that came into play, uh, I'm gonna come around about to your, to your question. The reason that came into play was, uh, I think someone somewhere realized that uh, if patients came in and just said no, 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 no to everything, uh, that we might not get the information we need to make a decision, so they included that for us. So we can actually go and request that information. There's another concept of circle of care, and so this actually comes up for us when, uh, for myself, when some of my patients end up in prison, unfortunately, they don't want to talk to us or they end up alone. Um, I can at least contact the staff members in the prison and say, you know, we're part of the circle of care, you're taking care of the patient. So there's a little bit of wiggle room. Um, it's just finding the wiggle room. So for families in particular, I will just set family meetings. Uh, I just set them. Um, and uh, individuals may say, you know, I'm not showing up. I work mostly on the inpatient unit. And they'll say, you know, I'm just not gonna show up. I said, that's fine, I said, but your family's gonna come. They're gonna tell me what's going on. And they'll say, well, for example, you know, I don't want you to talk to them. Well, you know, you can't actually tell me who I can talk to and I can't talk to, um, right? So the person often, so PIPA, um, says that I can't share information that you don't want me to uh, about your personal health information, but it doesn't mean I can't get information. So if, a family, if someone ends up in the hospital because a family member raised a concern, I think it would be remiss of us to not speak to that person. Uh, because how can we make a decision around you know, what, what the mental health contribution has been, the symptoms of what's been going on, if the person who raised a concern in the first place is not able to communicate with us. It may happen that individuals are completely different at the time we went to see them. That would happen to me as a resident. I would do a nice full interview, everything would look good, I'd present it, and then I'd turn around and the patient tells my supervisor a completely different story. So uh, these things happen, um, uh, but sometimes patterns need to emerge. And I think that's the tension between the law and uh, autonomy and individual rights. So how can, so I do a lot of review boards and the review boards will always ask me, what happened in the past? Well, you know, four years ago they did this. Um, so what's the pattern? So I, I get asked that a lot. So unfortunately that's sort of where, we, where we're at. We, we are looking for patterns. So for families, I just set them and I invite the families to come in. Sometimes, it, sometimes individuals don't want to see their families at all. I'll say, that's fine, I'll just see them. You're welcome to join if you like. If you don't want to join, that's okay. Um, if I do find someone incapable to consent to treatment, uh, an individual, I'm allowed to share information with the family members around treatment because how can you make a decision? How can I get consent if um, you don't have the information you need to make a rational decision? So there's those kinds of 
kind of, they're, they're not loopholes, but there's, there's a way of finessing things. So sometimes if, if I tell, a, if, if I go in to a, maybe an acutely psychotic patient, I say, can I please have a family meeting? It's different than me just saying, you know, we're gonna set a family meeting for tomorrow, your family has raised some concerns, we need to talk to them. Uh, sometimes I have family members that just say, look, that's not my family. And so then my first question is very strange. Do you remember giving birth to this person? Um, and I'll get a yes and kind of go from there. But really, if I went to a judge and I said, this person is telling me this is not their family. This person is telling me they birthed this person. So we can kind of get sometimes in some strange situations, if, if that makes sense. But I think if we work together and try and just talk to each other, communicate, um, you know, if you give printed information, like what's happened, the, the, the timeline for things, um, if we want to submit it to court, it needs to be signed and dated, um, and, and your names have to be on it. So I will sometimes do that in lieu of families coming in and testifying. Uh, so there's a, a few ways around things. Um, if you wanted to initiate a family meeting, so I'll speak on the inpatient unit, you can always call and ask the nursing staff, how is this person doing? They'll tell you maybe we can't give any information. Okay, that's fine, I'm the family member. I'm thinking about visiting. Can I visit? Okay, let me get back to you. And then the nursing staff might come back to you. Um, if you've had the family meeting, at least you have some, you've met the physician, you've met the social worker, maybe there can be a relationship there. Um, so again, I, I try and invite families as much as possible. In some situations, it's absolutely not possible. And on our end, sometimes the individuals may tell us that the family's been abusive or, or whatnot, so they don't want. So again, we have to balance all those things as well on our end too. Um, our so our, our primary responsibility is the patient, and by that I mean that's where our fiduciary responsibility lies. Um, but again, the family is such an important aspect to that that uh, uh, we, we, we cannot discount families. The urgent care center that has x-rays and a number of other things is open from 4 p.m. until midnight, and that's at Major Mac and Jane. The purpose for that was to offload some of the emergency room visits from the hospital. When, I, I should be more clear, uh, when I say urgent um, clinic, I'm, I'm talking about our mental health urgent clinic. So we have a mental health urgent clinic. It, it really, it, it's an offshoot of our emergency department. So the emergency physician will often be very late to that clinic because there may be a lot of individuals in the emergency room, but it's to help prevent people from ending up in the emergency department where they have to wait a long time and, and why not. So that's open to family doctors. You need a family doctor's referral for it and the family doctor has to identify it as urgent. So that's open, because our wait times can be long for individual psychiatry, that's open for family doctors if they need some uh, to be seen urgently. So most hospitals will have something along those lines. Um, in, at McKenzie Health, we don't actually have a family health team the same setup, and we don't have family health uh, occurring at McKenzie Health in the same way as other places, so we don't have that integrated um, uh, consultation liaison model. When I worked at North York General Hospital, I would go down and see individuals in the family practice office. At Sunnybrook, we would do the same. So generally, hospitals that have family doctor's offices will have a consultate, um, sorry, a shared care model where the uh, psychiatrist will go down and see individuals in, 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 in that office.